Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I feel welcome that way too. <laughs> welcome to this celebration of uh, advances brought to our nation and the world in these first two years of operation for Blue Waters. And to this discussion about the possibilities ahead of us that would be possible with continued investments in high performance computing. First, I wish to recognize two very special guests today. Welcome, a hearty Alina welcome to Senator Mark Kirk, a strong supporter, I say it again, a strong supporter of the University of Illinois and an advocate, a strong advocate for strong investment in scientific research and discovery. It is a pleasure to have you on our campus. I also want to welcome Dr. Jim Kurose, the Assistant Director for NSF Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. NSF has been a long and essential partner for the University of Illinois across many disciplines, but probably not so visible and, of course, so grand a scale as in supercomputing. Thank you to the panelists also who will share their research stories and their own visions for the future that these tools open to us all. And that is what Blue Waters and indeed high performance computing is all about, opening a better future for every one of us. This facility, this computer, may be physically located in Urbana Champaign, but make no mistake, it is a, it's truly a national research resource. Since it came online two years ago, engineers, educators, scientists, universities, and corporations around the country have used its vast power to solve complex problems and to push the edges of discovery in virtually every discipline. Blue Waters is not simply a number crunching machine. Instead, it is a tool that lets us explore the origins of the universe, map a genetic identity, predict and prepare for natural disasters, and to unwind the microscopic or nanoscale mysteries of some of the most devastating diseases of our time. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand from Ed that we are just getting started. Where we go from here, whether today with blue waters or tomorrow with the next generation of high performance computing systems, these are only limited by, collective, by our collective imagination and by our collective commitment to continue the state, federal, and private investment in this field that has brought us so far so quickly. As I mentioned to the, to the Senator, Central Illinois is very fertile, very, very fertile. Corn, soybean, we grow things here. This campus is very fertile. We grow things. We grow humans. We grow very, very young, bring very young minds to campus, raw young minds, I call it, and we turn them into refined young minds to go and change the world. The instrument here, the microscope, as we call it, the supercomputer, is one element that allows us to make that claim. So again, I welcome you, I welcome you all, again to the Senator and to Senator, uh, to, not Senator, to Dr. Jim Kurose, and now I turn the uh, podium over to Ed Seidel. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Welcome to NCSA. And it's a privilege to have Senator Kirk and Assistant Director Jim Carosa here from the National Science Foundation and to have all of you here at this event. Uh, NCSA has a 30-year history of changing the world. It helped initiate the scientific computing revolution uh, about three decades ago, and it has not stopped since then. So among other things, it has created the graphical web browser, that's revolutionized the way we interact with computers and information. You couldn't imagine life without a web browser these days. It's added trillions of dollars to the world economy. Uh, there are many great things that have come out of this. 
And my own field of research, uh, and indeed my own career, took a huge leap forward in the 1980s and the 1990s when I was able to do the first three-dimensional simulations of black holes. And in fact, how many of you have seen the movie Interstellar? So it's a very exciting event, uh, and the central uh, event in that movie is the travel through the wormhole. And most of my career has been studying wormholes on machines like this uh, Blue Waters uh, supercomputer. So that was my first Blue Waters moment when my career took a big leap forward because of machines of two decades ago allowed us to do things that were simply unthinkable, impossible before the machine was introduced. So today we're celebrating another Blue Waters moment, that is the, uh, the unveiling and then that already into the second year of operations of the Blue Waters supercomputer, a quantum leap above all other machines in the country and uh, among, uh, above the uh, other NSF supported systems. It's by far the largest system that Cray has ever built. It's the most powerful system in the NSF portfolio and it and the NCSA team the real experts that make this machine run are enabling scientific discoveries that are not possible in any other way or on any other system in the country. Today we're going to hear from a number of uh, Blue Waters users. Uh, right to the right here, there are four uh, users we have um, in, uh, on the stage. We have, uh, on the other hand, supported over 130 teams at the present time using the machine, and in fact over 200 teams across the country and in fact across the world that use this machine because there's no other place they can get their science advanced at the level they can here. And in fact, just last Friday, uh, NSF announced that three Ebola projects will be uh, supported using the Blue Waters system. And Klaus Schulten uh, is one of the recipients of those, one of those awards to help us understand uh, the Ebola virus. So I'll come back to that shortly, but now I have a, the special honor of introducing Senator Kirk. Born in Champaign, Senator Kirk was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 2000 and went on to serve five terms representing the people of Illinois' 10th congressional district in Congress. In 2010, Senator Kirk was sworn in as United States Senator from the state of Illinois. He serves on the committees on appropriations, banking, housing and urban development, health, education, labor and pensions, as well as a special committee on aging. He's also a strong champion for the National Institutes of Health and of biomedical research in general, and that the role of high-performance computing plays in the success of both of these areas. Senator Kirk. Thank you. I just, uh, yeah. This is a return for me because I was born in Champaign. That, that mother, my mother, 55 years ago, worked at Iliac One a uh, yeah. <laughs> very small uh, computer that was maybe the startup of this uh, genius. I've been searching since I got elected senator to look for the cool things about our state to rebrand us beyond the Bogoyevich debacle. I am uh, constantly approached on, on the Senate floor by senators, hey, Kirk, you're the only senator who has in the prison cafeteria that one governor can tune to the other governor and say, hey, governor, the food was a lot better when you were running the place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> to get through that problem, I've been looking at uh, Blue Waters, especially noting uh, Mark Andreessen's uh, work here at creating the uh, Netscape browser, mm -hmm. which did open the whole dot-com boom. Looking at everything that has been invented in Illinois, and let me ask you a few things. The cell phone, the zipper, the vacuum cleaner, and the... Uh, cut out on, uh, on sidewalks that we all, we got, we wheelchair guys, we're all invented at, uh, the cell phone cutout was invented right here in Champaign. You know, and the electric blanket, we'll, we'll say, yeah. <laughs> the people in Peoria where I just came from, hey, Kirk always mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, let me have a, a graphic here that compares Blue Rotters to a couple of supercomputers around the country. If you look at it, you'll see Blue Rodders is uh, the fastest computer in the country. And uh, I was just asking uh, the team here about Stampede, the, te the, uh, the uh, Texas effort, and I'm told that our Blue Waters is much faster than uh, Stampede. I would say that uh, we need a kind of a computer space race mentality here because I've been advised that we are not as fast as China's high-end uh, 
Tianhe computer. The American people will kick in more money to make sure that we can be a number one. And I would say that $259 million spent here looks like a good expenditure to maintain the first in the world position. And Randy Huber is from here, from Caterpillar, where he says that, uh, but for the access to uh, Blue Waters, Caterpillar would not be able to innovate and uh, stay ahead of its competitors. And on behalf of uh, the people of uh, New Peoria that I represent, making sure CAT is long and strong to make to uh, keep uh, employment in the Peoria high is the critical function for us. Let's have a round of applause for our Caterpillar. <laughs> When I go back to Washington, and my job will be uh, to make sure that uh, the Senate understands more about Blue Waters and the critical role it can play in our country's economic future. To make sure, like uh, with uh, uh, Lee Orff's uh, work that you might have seen on the, on YouTube, showing uh, like an F5 uh, tornado which especially for the people of Washington, Illinois, who are wiped, nearly wiped out by such a tornado, would be very critical to understand where that thing is going and how fast it's going somewhere, to be able to issue warnings fast enough. So, would say uh, after $259 million here, we uh, now are uh, running the fastest computer in the country, and that's gonna be necessary for us to uh, run the fastest computer in the world here, I hope one day, especially for U of I, where we invented the uh, web browser. With that, let me uh, say thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Senator Kirk. So now we're going to move into our panel discussion, and I will introduce uh, uh, the the uh, members of the panel uh, one by one, and then um, we'll have some discussions. In fact, let's just start with Lee. So Lee Orff uh, is a professor at Central Michigan University. We'll be talking about severe thunderstorms that he is able to study using blue waters. Uh, as we know, especially in a state like Illinois, severe thunderstorms can cause billions of dollars in damage annually, as well as loss of life due to flooding, lightning, severe winds that are associated with tornadoes. However, in prediction of severe storms is a major challenge. In order to improve the accuracy of severe weather forecasts, we have to improve our understanding of severe weather phenomena. Lee Orff is a professor of atmospheric science at Central Michigan University and part of a research team that's using blue waters to better understand the inner workings of supercell thunderstorms and their most devastating product, the tornado. Lee? So this work is, uh, I want to do a little bit of uh, background before I get started on what blue waters has done. Some of you probably remember this storm. This is Plainfield, Illinois, 1990. Um, this was an F5 tornado. It destroyed um, a lot of Plainfield. It was one, one of the big bad things about this storm was that it wasn't, uh, a tornado warning was not issued in time. A tornado warning was issued 10 minutes after the storm passed through uh, Plainfield. Uh, it was a devastating storm. It hit the high school. Uh, I uh, uh, went to high school in Morris, Illinois, and played these guys, Plainfield, in football. So I actually, somewhere in here, there might be a football field, I don't know, that's Plainfield High School. Uh, a couple of years before this happened, I was actually on the field there, so it's kind of close to home. Um, more recently, uh, the Washington, Illinois tornado, as mentioned earlier, is an F4 tornado. Uh, one EF4 tornado, one step down from the most powerful tornado, whereas uh, Plainfield was an F5. I want to make, make it clear that the Weather Service has gotten much better at saving lives and, and, and getting ahead of these storms but we still have a lot of work to do because people are still dying, people are, are still getting hurt. So uh, as you can see here, this is the EF4 tornado of Washington. Uh, this caused three fatalities, 125 injuries. Uh, it happened in November, not the time when you're usually expecting this kind of thing. Some of you were probably impacted by this or knew somebody who was. More uh, going back to Pilger, Nebraska, this storm, uh, there was a whole family of EF4 tornadoes on the ground at one time for this storm complex, very, very devastating. Uh, it destroyed half the town of Pilger and uh, caused fatalities and, and also injuries. Now I want to fade into what Blue Waters is doing. This is a simulation of an EF5 tornado 
um, that descends naturally from an actual supercell thunderstorm. So the supercells are the big, powerful, rotating thunderstorms. And we initialized uh, this uh, storm, with a, we just got the storm going, and it grew, and a tornado came out. And this is kind of difficult to do, uh, much like the real world, where you don't get these kinds of tornadoes frequently. It's very difficult to get this kind of result numerically. And that tells me, actual, actually, that the model in Blue Waters is doing the right thing. If, if these things were easy to do, then we would do, it wouldn't be right because uh, it doesn't match nature. Um, so here's a view of the storm kind of from a distance, kind of giving you a, a sense of the scale. Um, you have to resolve this tiny little tornado here, which looks small from this distance, but you also have to capture the whole storm so it can form naturally. You have lots of scales of motion to capture. We can also use visualization techniques that we developed with Blue Water's help and some of the wonderful support staff for Blue Waters. This is a, a measure of rotation. This is the tornado. It's doing all sorts of crazy things. There's lots of small scale flow as well. Um, we've identified new flow patterns that we really haven't seen before. Uh, this this uh, is just following the air near the uh, outer uh, reaches of the storm where it produces cold air from the precipitation. You can see the tornado over here rotating away, and here's this other sort of circulation that's being tilted into the updraft of the supercell that's sort of pr providing all the energy. And it's, it's very likely, and we're still analyzing this, that this kind of circulation is actually very critical in uh, having the storm last as long as it does. And this is the kind of stuff that uh, you can't just do with a desktop machine or even some of the exceed resources that we have um, because Blue Waters has just been really good top to bottom. Uh, it's very reliable, very fast. The support staff is incredible. And you, you don't want to leave uh, sight of the, of, the, of the staff on this because um, these machines are very, are very complex. So what are we going to do in the future? We want to do more storms like this. I want to simulate other environments that, where there were long track EF5 tornadoes. We really want to uh, capture what's going on near the ground better, and that means more resolution, more grid points. And Blue Waters can, in its current uh, configuration, I can do that uh, with another allocation. We're <laughs> working on that down the road. Uh, hint, hint. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, uh, we want to get new insight into these storms. In other words, why are these storms producing these long track tornadoes where other storms are just producing weak tornadoes or no tornado at all? And that is a real critical question right now in severe storms meteorology. We haven't answered it yet. We're getting closer and closer. But ultimately, we want to save lives. I mean, we want fewer false alarms, more accurate targeted warnings, and fewer fatalities. And this is a good step in that direction. It's sort of a, the term quantum leap was used. And I think this is kind of a quantum leap uh, type of result. Blue Waters did this with some help, you know, but it was a very important piece of the puzzle. It couldn't have happened on other, on other uh, machines. And finally, I just want to just, you know, say that supercomputing is, is a great thing. <coughs> Clearly, I'm excited about it. You just can't do this kind of thing without supercomputers, pure and simple. And Blue Waters is an incredible machine, and I'm, uh, I'm privileged to be able to use it. And I've, uh, I just wanted to say that I'm uh, very grateful and, uh, and very happy with, uh, with the machine and the support staff. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Next is Randy Huber. Uh, almost as soon as NCSA opened, the center began collaborating with companies through the private sector program. And in fact, rather than just saying, we'll have a private sector program, the kind of bold leadership that NCSA has always had took out a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal and said, we're open for business for America's uh, economic development. And that led to a number of companies joining the private sector program. And Caterpillar has been here since, uh, since the very early stages of that. Through the years, we've seen industry demand for simulation-based engineering and science increase as companies face tremendous pressures to remain competitive in an ever-changing business climate. And Caterpillar has been one of the industrial partners from the beginning. So we're happy to have Randy Huber, Advanced Virtual Product Development Manager at Caterpillar, here with us today to share his experiences. Randy? Thank you. I think I'll just do it from okay, here because sure. I don't have a lot of animation, so I, I, I'm not going to flash you today. So as I said, my name's Randy Huber, and I have a little over 35 years of product development experience for Caterpillar. I know it doesn't look that way, but that's okay. I'll, I'll accept that. But uh, ranging anywhere from engines to machines to research to, to uh, post-production and pretty much everything in between. So as I was preparing for just a few remarks, I, I stepped back and I said, one of the questions someone might ask is, well, why would an industrial manufacturer focused on product development want to participate in a high-performance computing seminar like this? And so 
As I look back, and, and Senator Kirk, there's a few things you can add to your innovation list on this. Not that I would tell the senator what to do, but if you look through it, you know, ranging from the first oval track type track, first diesel engine, all the way through up through the electric drive and hybrid technologies, and quite honestly, we're not stopping there. We can't. The world is moving very, very fast. We're in a global marketplace. Technology is accelerating. For us to remain relevant as an industrial manufacturer from a U.S. base, we must innovate. And one of the keys to that innovation is our ability to have realism in our simulations. So as you step back, I'll make an example. So today, we, we model soil and dirt and rocks. We're, we're kind of odd that way, but that's just what we do. We move material. So you think about it in the context of a, a large model for us might be a million particles of whatever, soil, sand, rock, aggregate. If I, and I thought about doing this, but I didn't think my NCSA partners would appreciate it. If I had, it, so you gotta use your imagination. I've got a handful of sand sitting here, heaped up. There's a million particles in that handful of sand. So step back, last time I checked, we don't make any machines that just move a handful of sand. So. There, there's a million particles. It takes us several weeks of running on computers to solve that problem. There's a million particles in my hand. Maybe I've missed something in the translation. So as we think about what we're trying to do, and we don't want to just run one example of this. We want to be able to, to change every size, shape, orientation. How does that do that? And why do we want to do that? We want to bring innovative value to our customers, where we drive lower fuel consumption, better emissions so that the air is cleaner. We want to move the material efficiently. We want to make that <coughs> independent contractor, that large contract, we want to make him really, really productive so that he can do things at a lower cost, so that he can deliver value to society. So that's real. So we, look, we need to drive that realism. And I've got all sorts of examples, but I won't go into that, whether it's you know how we model gas combustion engines and drive emissions down, or how we model barrels of oil sitting in an axle housing and the efficiencies that we drive towards that. We have to get realism in simulation. And HPC is, is a key ingredient to an or high performance computing is an ingredient to letting us get there. So uh, it was referenced that we've been here since uh, actually the first interaction I had was in the late 80s uh, with NCSA. And why did we come down here? We came down here for high performance computing. And I make the analogy that this little device here has as much computing power and speed that we came down here for in the late 80s. The high performance computer of today is the industrial workstation of tomorrow. And for us as an industrial manufacturer, we have to learn how to leverage that, how to make use of that to deliver better products for our marketplace. And the other thing we discovered as we came down here at the time was, yes, there's very fast computers, but there's also, and you're very impressed with the people that you'll hear from today, and there's a whole army of these high caliber scientists and researchers that I think they've all been trained never to say, well, we can't do that. And for an industrial manufacturer, it's really beneficial because sometimes you get in that mode that you don't recognize, oh, wait a second, maybe that problem can be solved. Maybe I can do something that I hadn't thought of before. So I'll summarize, why is Caterpillar very, very interested and excited about our relationship with NCSA and the high performance compute capacity? Realism in our simulations, driving value to our customers and access to talent that just expands and helps us be globally competitive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Randy. Next, uh, Rohit uh, Bhargava. Rohit is a professor in the Department of Bioengineering here at the University of Illinois and a full-time faculty member in the Beckman Institute and the Biomedical uh, Science and Engineering Technology Group. Uh, the central theme of this research group is the development of novel technologies that can be used to detect, diagnose, and understand tissue structure uh, in cancer pathology. Dr. Bargava will share with us how he uses blue waters to advance his research. Thank you, Ed. So as I think most of us know today, uh, with the biggest problem in our society, is really all about delivering health care at lower costs and a quality that is higher than what we have today. This is the overarching challenge, and I would argue it is the biggest challenge facing our society today. And the question is that what should we do, which, which is the critical step 
uh, where we can intervene that allows us to make a difference in this case. And I would argue that step is in diagnostics. So what I'll give you today is an example of what happens uh, in cancer diagnostics and how computing is going to change that paradigm uh, soon enough. So here's what, uh, what it looks like typically if you go to a clinic. Uh, if there is a suspicion for cancer, a needle will be inserted in a piece of tissue taken out. It is sliced thin, put on a glass slide, and uh, some dyes are put on it. And a human uh, will look at that image that you see, the pinkish bluish image there, uh, and tell you that this is cancer or not. Uh, what we're trying to do here is develop a new kind of microscope which doesn't just measure the structure of, of images but actually measures the chemistry. So it combines spectroscopy and chemistry together and what ends up happening is we have these extremely large data sets uh, that look not just at the X and Y structure but also uh, there's chemical information. Uh, we can look at the chemical information all day long uh, and we can start to pull out interesting things from it. But really what we're after is trying to get an image that looks like this. So on top here is a color-coded image that in one instant tells a clinician that here, look, there's blood here, there's a, a nerve here, there's some tissue here that might have cancer and so on. And this is done in our laboratory entirely without any human interpretation because we have computing at the backbone. So we collect all this chemistry data uh, at the back end, use computer algorithms, and then we can generate visualizations like this. Now, the first time uh, I ran this program, I wrote the original code myself, ran it on a desktop, just doing the first step took 23 days. Uh, this was 10 years ago. Uh, our desktops have improved considerably, but just running this iteration once for one set of samples takes about three to four days on your desktop. You simply cannot uh, optimize this for thousands of patients uh, together. Here, as I mentioned, is the need uh, that we have today. This is our overarching need. In my lab, we have four uh, sorts of ideas that we work on. The idea is how can we make a system that can process many, many tissue samples very rapidly so that we don't have any delays, we don't have any errors, and, and perhaps we can help uh, beleaguered clinicians uh, with some help. But I want to point out today, I'll just give you one example of the very last thing that we're doing. Today, if somebody is diagnosed with prostate or breast cancer, we cannot say if the cancer in that person will actually prove lethal. They have cancer, but is it a dangerous cancer? Is it going to kill them? No, we have no idea. 230,000 people are diagnosed with prostate cancer, and here's a little graphic that tells you if you screen 1,000 men for 10 years with the PSA test, you'll end up with 100 of them being diagnosed at can as cancerous, whereas they don't actually have any cancer in their body. You'll have 100 of them, 110 of them, being diagnosed at cancer, and we will find cancer uh, in their body. If you left everybody alone, uh, then five people will die from the disease. Today, we treat almost 97% of people in our country uh, with, with some sort of advanced therapy. The approximate cost is $20,000 a year, uh, roughly, to treat these people. After treating everybody, almost everybody, 97%, still four to five people die of the disease. We save one life for this whole paradigm, right? If you could just take 5% of those people, if you could take 10,000 people and save $20,000 a year, uh, that's $200 million a year. It's approximately uh, the investment that we've made here in computing. So this is the return that computing can bring for us if we can make this, this possible. So the question is, why do we need computing? The reason is this. Up until now, for the last 150 years, we've always thought of cancer as one cell type. There's one cell that's going to become a renegade cell. It's going to cause cancer and all that. That is completely not true. What actually happens is that one cell turns cancerous, and it needs many other cells to grow with it. This is like saying the car is just a door. No, it's the engine, it's the door, it's the computer in your car even nowadays. So the principle that my lab is working on is how do these many different cell types and their chemistries interact in a way that allows us to predict whether this cancer will grow or not. And that is simply something that cannot be done by a human. It cannot be done by groups of humans. In fact, it cannot even be done on my desktop. Uh, we really need some, some computing for that. So here I'll quickly show you the, our most recent result. What we've been able to do is we've been able to, to beat the current medical paradigm, the current medical system, uh, in predicting who has dangerous prostate cancer. At this point, the accuracy of our method is about 85%. Uh, we believe that if we have better computing algorithms, we extract the data in a better way, we come up with new models to predict how disease will progress, then perhaps we can get to a point where we can have a test that efficiently tells 10 or 15,000 people uh, using this sort of computation background in the background, uh, tells them, look, there is your prostate cancer is no problem at all. Go home, relax. Nothing will happen for the next 15 years. 
Even if we can do that for five or 10,000 people, it'll save people from problems like incontinence, importance, and just quality of life, in addition, of course, to the $200 million a year that we can do it. So this is all fine. The tissue still needs to come out. Uh, we need to look at it. Uh, this is another uh, really new result that we've got. And what we're doing here is on the left side, you see molecular uh, imaging that we need to take the tissue out now, put some dyes and stain it. The top dye costs about five cents per slide. The bottom dye costs about $300 a slide. So even in a diagnostic test, this is not done routinely. On the right-hand side, what we can do is just using light and computation. So we call this painting with light. And again, you can see on the left and right side, these are two examples. The left side is really what you can do with dyes today. The right-hand side is what you can do with computers. Not only that, if you can compositely manage this. It, Let me ask a question. Sure. Does this mean the National Association of Pathologists is going to come to me <laughs> saying that they uh, want to shut you down? No, sir. They, they love this because I'll tell you what we're doing with this. So right now, you take a, a piece of tissue out, and you put it on a glass slide, and then you look at it. What we can do is insert our probe inside the body. And you can start to see images now that look like this. Some molecular imaging inside the body that a pathologist still would have to interpret. Uh, the analogy we give, uh, Senator Kirk, is that this is like a typewriter being replaced by Microsoft Word. It hasn't made the author obsolete, but it has certainly made our mistakes more bearable. And we can see those kind of things. So this is it. The final piece of this puzzle, uh, and this is again the ingenuity on our campus, what we've been working with our biologists on this campus, that put cells in very specific places, and we can make tumors in the lab that allow us to drive the tumor in the lab and see how this will, will actually work out. So again, this is a long story that allows computation, allows us to predict how to make this, but I'll cut this story short and say, we've made a 3D printer now, and the goal here is to print little tumors in a dish so we can watch uh, tumors as they grow. And eventually the idea is that we'll take a patient's cells, just a few cells from a patient, uh, use our 3D printer to actually print tumors uh, from their own cells uh, and uh, print them in thousands of different ways, put different drugs on it. And before we even give a single bit of chemotherapy to a patient, we'll figure out which dosage will work for them and which ones will be effective or not. So that's where the future is. And again, this is all enabled simply because we can understand how cells talk to each other uh, using computers. So thank you. And I thank, thank you. Thanks, Rohit. That's, that's very exciting. So uh, last but not least, Professor Klaus Schulten. Uh, is, Klaus is someone who needs no introduction for those of us here at NCSA. If you simply say the word Klaus, you know exactly who we're talking about. Uh, Klaus is the leader of the theoretical and computational biophysics group here at the University of Illinois. He's pioneered the development of tools and techniques that he collectively refers to as the computational microscope. The analogy is apt. Just as light microscopes gave scientists the first glimpse of cells, today Klaus and others use computational methods to obtain even more fine-grained look at the basics of life. Using Blue Waters, his team was for the first time able to determine how the HIV virus um, uh, shell protects the, the genetic material within uh, the virus, and, and which is the key to its virulence. So Klaus was just awarded a Blue Waters allocation also to study the Ebola virus. Klaus? Thank you. So thank you very much to our legislature and uh, our government and NCSA for providing this wonderful machine. Uh, we in the Midwest don't have only straight streets as seen from outer space, but uh, we also have the world's best uh, uh, microscope, namely Blue Waters. That is what uh, we made out of this computer, microscope. And this microscope helps biomedical research. I just show some examples. Here is uh, <clears throat> an example from Alzheimer's disease. There we have the plaques that grow from beta amyloid fibrils. And we see for the first time in uh, blue water, in, with blue water, how this fibril grow actually works. We see that it is patient specific, that is even tissue specific, with a lot of variation, 
and we see that one end of the fibers, the, the tip of the fibers, grows faster than the bottom of the fibers, completely <laughs> new, and we can now develop new therapies by having a view that has never been seen before. Alzheimer is an, a great um, medical calamity, but uh, even greater, more dangerous calamity is uh, the resistance against antibiotic drug. It's a great health threat. We need to develop new antibiotics. And in order to do that, we need to know how they work to begin with. And here's a very common antibiotic that has been investigated uh, here at Blue Waters together with, with uh, Professor Menking at University of Illinois Chicago and uh, with uh, Professor Wilson at the uh, um, uh, University of Munich. We see in detail that was completely unfathomable uh, uh, impossible before uh, how actually this particular antibiotic acts in the target of this drug, namely the microbial uh, ribosome, and understanding now for the first time how they actually act, the, the, this particular uh, uh, antibiotic, we can now develop new kinds of antibiotic that hopefully will be at least for a while res uh, not resistant or we rather have it even for a longer time uh, not becoming uh, resistant by the, by the bacteria. Um, and, uh, another uh, medical problem, as we all know, is uh, HIV infection. And uh, what was achieved two years ago here on Blue Waters is the solution of the structure of this virus, particularly of its capsid. So here at Blue Waters, the eyes of the researcher for, for the first time, an atom-by-atom atom view of this capsid. Now people ask us, why do you want to see the capsid? Just a container that contains the genetic material that infects the cell. What's so interesting about it? We didn't know so much ourselves, except, you know, we just wanted to know uh, because uh, researchers just wanted to know. Here you see how we simulated it uh, on the on the blue waters, atom by atom, 64 million atom simulation at the time, the largest simulation done, published in Nature in 2013. Now, what did we learn from it? Huge amount. Because what we realized is that the capsid is not just a container for the uh, genetic material of the virus with which it infects a cell. It is a tricky surface that, uh, that uh, um, uh, tricks the, the, the living cell into helping it. it uh, the living cell gives it these red proteins that look then like the capsid got the German measles, and, uh, and uh, it's covered with it, and these red proteins help the capsid to find the nucleus of the cell where it injects its genetic material. At the same time, the capsid decorates itself with its red protein in such a way that another cellular protein which tries to cut apart the capsid and thereby defends the cell against the infection is, uh, is, uh, cannot get a foothold on the capsid. This is called the protein E2. It cannot bind. So what we see now is a capsid is far from just being a boring container. It is a communication surface with the cell that needs to communicate with the cell in order to have a successful uh, uh, um, uh, uh, infection. Now, our body is a society of molecules. In fact, every of our human cells is a society of molecules. Every cell contains as many proteins as a society as the United States contains citizens, namely several, several uh, 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 hundred million uh, proteins. Now, uh, today, um, Blue Waters can simulate such a society of, 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 of proteins, it can simulate almost a full life form of a living cell. Here what we simulate in, the, uh, in blue waters, not quite the full uh, United States, but let's say the state of Delaware. Still very interesting and absolutely first time. We see here and machinery, uh, uh, as it is moving, that is doing the following. It absorbs sunlight, and uh, turns the sunlight into chemical energy. You see there how sunlight is, ob uh, is absorbed, migrating through this, uh, um, this system of many, many proteins. Uh, 
uh, the, 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 the light energy is then used to make red molecules. The red molecules are then full of energy and uh, turning slowly the entire uh, machinery red. Then the red molecules are turned into some blue charge inside of this capsid that finally is then turned into the synthesis of ATP that drives the biological cell and, uh, and that is then uh, the energy content that is uh, coming from the sunlight. And, uh, and here we see how this, how much uh, uh, part of a an, of an photosynthetic cell we have here. And so we can say for the first time we have an autonomous part of a living cell that is described at the atomic, even electronic level in uh, in uh, 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 blue water. So blue water is, is really getting us close to understanding a living system uh, at a completely new level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Klaus. So thank you all. I think, uh, to me, this illustrates a, a breathtaking array of different kinds of scientific applications that are leading to new discoveries out of a single instrument. Quite often when you make investments of this scale in an instrument, for example, in a telescope, it teaches you a lot about the universe or about astronomy, but this instrument is having uh, impact in all areas of science and also in industrial competitiveness. So I think that illustrates that beautifully. Uh, I think we're, we're running low on time, so I, if there was a question or two from the audience, uh, now would be a good time for that, and then Jim Carosi will make some final remarks. All right. I will wait another minute, second. <laughs> I once saw Tom DeFonte simply calling on people from the audience to get, ask questions, but I won't do that this time. So I think I want to thank the, the speakers. Thank you very much for all of your efforts and the great work you've been doing on the machine. So thanks. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jim Carosa, who is the uh, assistant director at NSF for uh, the so-called SIZE Director, Com Com Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Jim is on leave from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, at UMass, he serves as distinguished professor at the School of Computer Science. Uh, he's also been a dean at, uh, at UMass, and so therefore he understands the breadth of scientific activities, and in this context, particularly those that demand high-performance computing and cyber infrastructure. So it's a pleasure to have Jim uh, as our uh, AD for uh, size at NSF, and love to have you make some remarks. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Senator Kirk, uh, Provost Adi, is it okay to call you Adi? Um, Vice Chancellor Schiffer, NCAA Director Ed Seidel, and really everybody here, I'm so happy to be here to be able to celebrate the second year of operation of, uh, of Blue Broaders, and really we're here to celebrate all these tremendous accomplishments, scientific accomplishments that we've just, we've just heard about here. You know, Really, when I retire from NSF, I want to come here and be a student in each of your courses. Uh, we just really heard, we heard about four really absolutely extraordinary advances in science and engineering, determining the precise structure of the uh, 64 million uh, atom simulation of the AIDS, uh, the, the capsid, the shell around it, using new chemical imaging techniques to improve cancer diagnosis and detection, looking at supercell and tornado formations, and looking at the use of HPC to accelerate product development at Caterpillar. These, are, these might seem like four really different things, but all of these breakthroughs were enabled and really indeed wouldn't have even happened in the first place without Blue Waters, and I think that's really, really remarkable. Um, and I should add that these four that we heard about are only four of a much larger number of scientific breakthroughs that, uh, that we've seen in Blue Waters just in these first two years. Um, honestly, I had the pleasure of reading the first annual Blue Waters report that was like about that thick that talked about more than 60 breakthroughs. And really, I read it from cover to cover. And really, I'm looking forward to the year two report that's going to come in and talk about more of these. It'll be uh, twice as long. What's that? It's going to be, be twice, twice as, as long? long? Okay, well, great, great. Um, reading all of these and hearing about this kind of work, it's just so clear how Blue Waters has really been a game changer in pushing forward 
uh, the frontiers of science and engineering. And maybe if I could uh, paraphrase Senator Kirk, Blue Waters is really cool. It really is cool. Um, I want to acknowledge the remarkable work of the entire uh, team of domain scientists, the Blue Waters Research and Facilities staff, the operations and the leadership folks here who have made all of this work uh, possible in the first place. And on behalf of the NSF, I also want to acknowledge the exceptional support received from the state of Illinois. Thank you, Senator Kirk, the University of Illinois, President Easter, Chancellor Wise, Provost Adi, uh, Vice Chancellor for Research uh, Schiffer, the NCSA, and all of the industrial partners, uh, including Cray, Zerotech, NVIDIA, and others. This partnership is incredibly uh, powerful. The, the partnership among the state, the university, industry, and, and federal government has seen Blue Waters through its acquisition and now through its incredibly successful operational phase. I know everybody here takes tremendous pride in all of these uh, all of these accomplishments that we've seen showcased today. So Blue Waters really does represent an historic <laughs> milestone in advanced computational infrastructure, uh, and the NSF has been very proud to play a significant role in this national uh, resource. As Senator Kirk noted, Blue Waters is really a unique, there was that really nice graphic that, that he put up earlier, it's a unique advanced computing system, and really the technology is absolutely cutting edge. As one of the world's most powerful systems, Blue Waters enabled sustained petaflops, as we've seen for large scale, very large scale, scientific computations. The folks who designed Blue Waters must have had a crystal ball because they designed it with 380 petabytes of nearline storage, so really foreseeing data science and the importance of data in with scientific computation years before data science and big data became a buzzword. Blue Waters has multiple 100 gigabit secure connectivity to multiple science networks that enables large scale data transfers and remote experimentations across the United States. So these really visionary technical capabilities are now brought to life. They're, 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 they're uh, brought into action uh, by, by software and by expertise. And so taken all together, the hardware, the software, the data, uh, and, and the networks, and probably most importantly, the people. And I imagine these are the people here who are, who, who are sitting in this room. These people make Blue Waters this incredibly versatile, experimental, um, scientific instrument. As, as Klaus noted, you, we can think of it as a computational microscope. It could be a telescope. It could be a time machine. Uh, it could allow us to look at. It, it could allow us to look inside uh, tornadoes. It can help us uh, eradicate uh, uh, epidemics. It can predict disaster. Predict disasters. It can be a job creator, as well. So I want to also acknowledge, in, a different, in addition to the great science, I really do want to acknowledge the commitment to education, to workforce development, and uh, the outreach activities here at Blue Waters. The education and training programs have touched more than 860 participants in more than 28 institutions in just its first year. They've launched a number of industry projects like we just heard, really amazing pro project, industry projects like we heard about from, uh, from Caterpillar. And these and similar efforts, and there are many of them, are really creating the workforce that's so important to our nation and its technological leadership in the 21st century. As Ed mentioned, the National Science Foundation was an early supporter of high-end computing, establishing five supercomputer centers back in the 19, 1980s, including uh, NCSA here at UIUC. And that commitment to the importance of high-end computing, supercomputing, uh, and all it enables continues unabated since then. Today, NSF continues to support a very comprehensive ecosystem of advanced computational infrastructure, programs like Exceed, uh, like Exceed, which is also uh, headquartered here, and other resources that really enable these kinds of transformational and foundation changes, foundational changes in science and engineering. At NSF, we recognize the importance of these efforts in advancing discovery and innovation, and we at the NSF are committed to continuing to support this ecosystem into the future. 
So I want to close with just a couple words on, on, on leadership and, and, and partnership. You know, when you see successes like we've seen here today, they're often, at, in this case, are the result of visionary and long-term leadership over many years. It's that leadership and vision that brought us here to what we're seeing today. It's true for NCSA. It's true for Blue Waters specifically, and it's true for the National Science Foundation as well. So I want to acknowledge at the National Science Foundation, uh, Dan Atkins and Alan Blatecki and Irene Qualters, who have all played key roles in making Blue Waters possible. And that leadership continues today at NSF with Irene Qualters, who's currently our division director for advanced cyber infrastructure. Um, maybe most importantly, I, I really want to acknowledge the all-stars here at UIUC um, you know, in the area of high-performance computing. Really, you've got enough people here to field an all-star team in, I don't know, what's the biggest sport? Football, right? I mean, it's just amazing the stars that, that you folks have here. Uh, Bill Kramer's been an ama has been amazing as the long-term uh, PI of Blue Waters, and Ed Seidel, who you, now, you know, who you know as serving as the director of NCSA, also served as uh, a director of the Office of Cyber Infrastructure at NSF and the head of the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate at NS NSF as well. And it's really your folks' collective vision, hard work, and the partnerships that you've formed, the partnerships that involve everybody here in this room today that's made today's successes uh, possible. So in closing, um, you know, the, the breakthrough effort, research efforts that we've seen here today illustrate why Blue Waters is such a compelling investment. It's helping the United States push uh, scientific boundaries forward. It's expanding our capabilities to fuel discovery and innovation in industry and in science across a broad array of fields, all with the goal of enhancing our lives and expanding scientific uh, understanding. As a national resource, Blue Waters helps ensure that the United States remains a global leader in this important area. So I'm really, really honored and very grateful to be able to stand here with you today to celebrate all the successes of Blue Waters. Let me congratulate all of you on, on your really extraordinary and out, outstanding achievements. And let me promise to come back as a student and, and sit in on a couple of your classes too. Uh, um, thank you again. Thank you very much for the, for the privilege of sharing this wonderful occasion with you. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to also to Senator Kirk for coming to visit us. It's been a great pleasure to have you here with us. And to all of our panelists. Thanks. I think we're adjourned. Thanks.